a you know it's a it's a truism to say that the Middle East is a, a region of change and volatility and uncertainty, but um, the change in volatility and uncertainty in uh, in recent times is really quite quite jaw-dropping. Uh, now we're worrying about Lebanese invading Syria instead of the other way around. Uh, um, now uh, we're worrying about Assad uh, calling on the elected prime minister of Turkey to resign instead of the other way around. Um, uh, of course, one constant fact is that uh, there is uh, still a constitutional void in Egypt. There are no legitimate institutions in Egypt for uh, now two, almost two and a half years. Um, the Middle East is a very strange uh, and uncertain place. And it's in this um, uh, whirlwind, um, the metaphor that we've used to discuss today's event, it's in this whirlwind that we're here to discuss Israel and how the new Israeli government is um, adapting to and preparing for and, and approaching this uh, volatility, change, and uncertainty. Um, uh, we could not be more delighted than having our panelists here today, and I think today's turnout reflects the, um, uh, the respect that is uh, broadly held for our two panelists um, here in Washington. Um, I'm very delighted that Shai Fedlin and Dan Shiftan are um, here to discuss um, Israel in the whirlwind, a new government meets a changing security environment. Uh, they are um, two uh, uh, truly profound thinkers about Israel's situation in the Middle East, about um, Israel's role in the world, about uh, the American-Israeli security relationship, and what Americans need to know more about Israel, Israeli politics, and Israeli national security strategy. Uh, Shai, um, on my left, is the Judith and Sidney Swartz Director of the Crown Center from Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. Um, he uh, is, uh, just like Dan, no, um, no stranger to uh, Washington audiences and to those who follow uh, issues around the Middle East and Israeli national security. He served previously as the director of the Jaffe Center at Tel Aviv University, um, has a long and distinguished career, uh, one foot in academe and another foot in the world of policy analysis. Um, and we're very delighted that Shai could be down here um, from Brandeis today to join us for today's event. Um, also on the panel, as I mentioned, is of course Don Shiftan. Um, Dan, Don is the director of the National Security Studies Center at the University of Haifa and the Goldman Visiting Professor of Government here at Georgetown University. Um, Don um, is a very uh, provocative thinker, um, a person who is often um, ahead of his time and ahead of his colleagues and and uh, different ideas about Israeli national security strategy. Um, and um, I'm very pleased that Don is on today's uh, panel to offer um, his perspective on Israel and how Israel is dealing with and should deal with this changing security environment. Um, uh, this is, a, uh, I believe, a, an excellent prelude not just to uh, John Kerry's important speech later this afternoon, where I think he will touch on some of the issues that uh, um, our colleagues will be talking about, but also the visit next week to Washington of Israel's new Minister of Defense, uh, the first time coming in his capacity, uh, Moshe Ya'alon. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll have more to say about uh, Bogi Ya'alon's visit to Washington and, um, uh, and a, a presentation here at the Institute um, later on this week. So with that, it's my pleasure first to introduce, to bring Shai to the podium, then to bring Don to the podium, and then to open this up for what I'm sure will be quite an engaging uh, discussion session with everybody here in the room. Chai. Great, Rob, thank you very much for, uh, for having me. Uh, if I can uh, uh, begin with a 30-second um, sad note, um, I'd like to express my own uh, uh, personal um, condolences uh, for the loss of your former president, uh, Fred Lafer. Um, he was one of my favorite, favorite uh, individuals, um, a man who uh, I always thought was uh, so smart, uh, so nice, uh, so balanced, uh, so middle of the road <clears throat> that I personally am going to uh, really miss him. Um, secondly, um, 
I first arrived in Washington in 1976 as assistant congressional liaison uh, at the Israeli embassy. I just had to subtract from uh, 2013, 1976, and I came up with 37 years. So it's, and, and since uh, Mori Amitai was the leader of APAC when I got here, I thought, my God, have, where have these 37 years gone? Um, as you'll discover, there's not much that uh, Dan and I will agree on, except uh, that one time we spent in an undisclosed location in Greece and discovered that we are pretty strong competitors as to how many verses from Tom Lehrer's songs we remember. <laughs> and that also reveals you our age. Um, so what I thought I would do in the rest of the 19 minutes is to give you a sense of the way I look at the Israeli security in this environment. And I would say the broader, uh, in the broader sense of security, which includes uh, economic security, and it also includes uh, demographic um, security. And what I'll try to give you is a little bit of a balance sheet. Um, <clears throat> what challenges does Israel, uh, Israel's new government face? Um, what assets and liabilities uh, does it have? Now, of course, in doing all this in uh, now 18 and a half minutes means used to be, again, us uh, old geezers used to say, we'll give you the telegraphic version, but now for the benefit of the young people here, I'd have to say, I'll give you the Tweety uh, version uh, of this. And I'll definitely not dwell on the things that are, uh, you know, that have been a subject of, of huge attention. So I'll just mention a few challenges, talk a little bit about Israel's assets, and then I'll leave you with what I think is the bigger or the biggest uh, challenge. Um, I think that, uh, and so I'll say, first of all, up front, my three bottom lines. The first is that the new situation presents Israel with serious challenges. That doesn't take rocket science to understand that. But my point is that it also presents Israel with as many opportunities. Um, secondly, surprisingly enough, and you will find this especially surprising, those of you who know me by now, that I say this, uh, the Israeli government has actually handled uh, the situation uh, or the new situation that uh, Rob introduced us into actually quite well. I would say surprisingly uh, well. It's actually not made a major mistake in those two years uh, since the uh, awakening began, or two and a half years, and in handling the consequences of the changes that we've seen so far. Uh, and it even at times explained itself pretty well uh, including, for example, explaining what exactly the purposes of the operations in Syria were. That presents, of course, a, un, you know, an un, un, intolerable precedence, the fact that the Israeli government actually explains itself well. Um, so, um, so that was my second. And the third is that the biggest danger, in my view, is that uh, this success Will make it, is making it easier or will make it easier for the government to avoid what I think are the really hard decisions that are required to secure Israel's future as a Jewish and democratic state. So what are the main challenges? Well, number one, of course, is Iran. And there is hardly anything about this issue that has not already been said. This is an issue that's been debated thoroughly. It continues to be the most difficult issue, I have to say, that I've had to think about in the last 37 years of professional life. I don't think there are any good options. All the options have serious downsides. They've, they've been thoroughly examined and thoroughly debated. And I would say that uh, none of the serious issues that are the pillars of this debate that were raised in public two and a half years ago, whatever, by uh, the former head of the Mossad, Dagan, and others. In my view, none of these issues have actually decided the debate. So my only last point about this is that I think that, until now at least, the decisions, Israel's decisions on, on, on Iran have not been a derivative of these very serious issues that were debated but actually a derivative of one question, which is the relations between Israel and the United States, and particularly the relationship between Israel 
and uh, or between our two countries' um, defense communities. Second issue is Turkey. Uh, as we all know, the new Israeli government has already taken some significant steps towards mending fences uh, with Turkey. How far this can go remains an open question, uh, especially given the ambitions of uh, Turkey's uh, leaders or leader. The stakes are obviously very high given Turkey's role in the region uh, as a powerful country, as a member of NATO, as a country possessing the largest military in the region with a huge, robust economy that has become adept to using soft power uh, in, in the region. The third is, of course, the challenge of the last two and a half years. Let's say, put everything under the rubric of the Arab awakening. And again, as lo a lot has been already said about this, so let me just make a few points. Number one is, this, is not, this has not been about Israel. It's not even been about the United States. This has been about Arabs. But in the longer term, Israel, of course, will be affected uh, since it can no longer deal with a few Arab leaders. Uh, it has to take into account the Arab street and its importance uh, where Israel is not popular. And the rise of political Islam is a huge, huge challenge uh, for Israel. At the strategic level, of course, the question is uh, what kind of neighbors will Israel have, for example, in Egypt and Syria, with calls in Egypt for uh, revising the peace treaty, um, what will be the role of jihadists in the future of Syria? Uh, and of course, an equally, if not greater concern uh, is what will be the future uh, of Jordan. And at the operational and tactical level, uh, the challenge is how to deal with chaos. And we're already dealing with chaos in the Sinai, and we're dealing with semi-chaos uh, along the Golan on the Syrian front. Uh, where Israel is facing a situation where the central governments have lost control. And everybody who's been even remotely involved in military and defense planning knows um, dealing with chaos is the defense planners, every defense planner's nightmare, uh, where there's no address uh, for either coercion uh, or deterrence. Uh, so these are s three sets of very serious issues that the new government uh, has to deal with. On the plus side, now going to the asset side, I would say at, at 65, right, it's only been uh, a couple of weeks since uh, the May 15 inauguration or declaration of the state. Uh, on the plus side, at 65, we see a remarkable transformation of Israel's uh, strategic environment uh, with many positive outcomes, as I said, with many opportunities. And I would just give you the six highlights but what I see is the six pillars of Israel's grand strategic uh, balance uh, of power. The first, and uh, doesn't need elaboration here, is the unique relations that, or the unique manner and intensity and intimacy that U.S.-Israeli relations have reached, especially in the defense uh, realm. And because of this is the home of the Washington Institute, I don't think that this requires an elaboration of this subject here, but we can, of course, talk about it. Secondly, Israel today faces no conventional military threat. No conventional military threat. This is a huge transformation of Israel's strategic environment. In a situation where Syria and Iraq are either consumed by a civil war or are at the verge of a civil war, in the case of Iraq, uh, and the Arab world completely divided, between the Shias of Iran, Iraq, and Hezbollah, and the Sunnis of Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the smaller GCC states, uh, where in, especially in the Gulf, Israel is seen by many Gulf states, and, or at least their leaders, uh, as their allies against the common threat uh, of Iran. What do we have, even in the case of Syria, aside from the chaos on the minor side that I described? The Shia crazies led by uh, Nasrallah and uh, Hezbollah are battling the Sunni jihadist crazies inspired by Qardawi. Not even the Mossad is clever enough to have designed and choreographed <laughs> such, a, such a scenario. And, uh, and I would say to add to everything, without Syria and what we see in Syria, it's unlikely that uh, we would have seen the mending of the face fences between Israel and Turkey that we've seen uh, in recent uh, weeks. So that's number two. Number three, we have the Arab Peace Initiative. And 
you know, there is a lot of discussion about how the difficulties and what problems there are in the peace initiative that's just been reaffirmed and reconfirmed again. But we still have to keep it in perspective. <coughs> it is a transformation of an environment uh, in contrast to what happened 65 years ago in Israel uh, when the Arab League legitimized a invasion of Palestine by the armies of the Arab states and the Arab League is coming um, around a, something called the Arab Peace Initiative. The fourth is deterrence of non-state actors. Um, the, the, the traditional literature of security studies always told you, you can deter states, you can't deter non-state actors. Well, the fact of the matter is that with lots of lots of problems, uh, Israel is deterring, there is a balance of deterrence between Israel and Hezbollah since uh, the summer of 2006. And with the need for some reminders, there's also a pretty stable balance of deterrence between Israel uh, and Hamas. And again, we can argue about this and so on and so forth. But I would say it's not accidental that since the summer of 2006, we've not seen a single launch of a Katyusha rocket from Lebanon. And not only that, now this Hezbollah is now being sucked into a civil war uh, in Syria. That can't be seen as anything in the short term at least, as, as positive. The fifth pillar is Israel's, what I would call Israel's economic miracle. If the Turks found a way to integrate economic strength into an overall national security policy, then surely we should see economics as an integral part of security. And um, this is not just the product of the startup nation. It also has to do with the responsible management of the Israeli economy, a realm in which I actually give Netanyahu a lot of credit, both in 96, 99, and now. Not just fiscal responsibility, but also, not less important, the, relative, uh, the relatively sensible management of the Israeli banking sector that has never bought into the prime, the, the um, what was it? Subprime, Subprime and, and derivatives. And, and so on and so forth. So Israel's banking sector actually is doing exceedingly well, and the result is that Israel's GDP per capita today is of European levels, and when I say Europeans, I, didn't, I don't mean Greece. <laughs> um, and then the sixth and most strategic of all, with the recent or relatively recent natural gas findings, Israel is moving towards energy independence. Now I would just say, closing these six assets by only saying one thing, at this 65th birthday, if somehow, and I know it's impossible, Ben-Gurion could have been brought back for 24 hours and was presented with these six, you know, he would just say a, a w one word that our joint friend, very, very close personal friend Zev Shif used to say under such circumstances. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Exactly. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, what's, so if all this is good news, uh, what's the bad news? The bad news, in my view, is that the big danger is that with all these positives, uh, I fear that uh, it makes it slightly easier for the Israeli government to avoid making the hard decisions that are required to secure Israel's future as a Jewish and democratic state, which means, in my view, finding a way to, is to end Israel's occupation of the Palestinians uh, <coughs> or at least where this is possible, which is in the West Bank. And in my view, the danger here is not that there will be a third intifada. In fact, I would say the bigger danger is that there won't be a, a third intifada, that the Palestinians would simply let time take its course uh, until they will state that the situation is irreversible, that we have created a one-state reality. Now, Netanyahu says that this is also his nightmare. And I tend to actually take him seriously, but I would like to see some evidence that this is driving him to some concrete uh, decisions uh, and results. Um, so my final exclamation mark is, uh, with all these good news, is, uh, there is also this big cloud that I think is hovering over uh, Israel. And these good news, bad news, maybe I'll just end by saying my favorite story about the, about the unfortunate ending of the Cold War, which of course took, uh, now the, you know, we were pod podcasted and, and so now there's, 
With the end of the Cold War, the number of politically correct stories that you can tell, of course, is just completely off. So I, my favorite was this, this story about this commissar that was asked to do what I did, but in those days they did. They took four hours. And so he gave this four-hour speech in this call hall telling everybody about uh, the good news of the revolution and its achievements and so on. Finally, he said the Q&A and so on. So he said, uh, one of them raises his hand and says, yeah, but before you ask the question, what's your name? He says, my name is Dimitri. He says, Dimitri, what's the question? He says, Comrade Commissar, if everything is so good, why is everything so bad? <laughs> so the Commissar says, that's a fantastic question. He says, in a month's time, I'll come and I'll answer this question. So, so in a month's time, he gives exactly the same four-hour speech, and he takes Q&A. And so finally, finally, somebody answers. He says, what's your question? What's your name first? He says, my name is Igor. He says, Igor, what's your question? He says, Comrade Commissar, if everything is so good, where is Dimitri? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Shai. Um, Don, the floor is yours. Well, uh, first, I'm delighted that I've taken a completely different approach to the uh, subject of today's discussion than Shai has, because we would not have enough um, to discuss, we would not have enough to disagree after Shai's presentation. The only thing I disagree with Shai is the, the positive elements. All the rest, I, <laughs> I very strongly agree. And uh, also, I will not speak very much about what's happened in the Arab world recently, because I've spoken here in October 2011 and I made predictions and they all came true. So you already know exactly what I think about what's happening in the, in the Arab world today. I would, would like to speak about the Israeli society and to put it in historical perspective and speak about the paradigm change of the Israeli society in recent years. Actually, the subject of my presentation this morning will be Israel in the post-peace process era, because I think that many of us still think about the Middle East in terms of the peace process, and we need to understand why so many fundamental things have changed in the Israeli society, and I think it will impact what will happen uh, in Israel for a very long time to come. And even what we've seen recently, the new Israeli government is only a reflection of a very important part of this um, paradigm change. And actually, it has reversed something that happened in the two decades before the change. Between the Sadat initiative until the Second Intifada, we had an illusion in Israel about the things in the Middle East changing in a very fundamental and positive way from an Israeli point of view. This is peace. This is a different era. This is. This opens so many new opportunities to Israel to make peace and to find its way in the Middle East, to integrate or at least to be accepted in the Middle East. And 20 years later, since the year 2000, we've had the reality check where the Israeli government, where the Israeli society has internalized the fact that the operative part of the hope for peace should be at least shelved, if not put away altogether, at least shelved. And I'm speaking about two elements of it. The first is any kind of peace beyond preventing war ad hoc by deterrence, uh, military deterrence and um, political deterrence, and any way of finding itself as part of the Middle East certainly as an integrated part of the Middle East, but even being accepted in the Middle East. And the bad news about it is that we did not go back to square one, what we had before the 1967 war and the Sadat initiative. It is even more pessimistic. Because until this period, there was the belief that if we can keep the deterrence alive, or if you want to go back to 1923, the Iron Wall, alive for a long time, if we persuade the Arabs that we are strong, indestructible, that we can uh, maintain our existence in the region despite their major challenges, 
then one day the Arabs will give up. They will look at Israel and they'll say, Israel is so strong, we um, need to give up our, home, uh, our hope to um, undermine Israel. And now we are already aware of the fact that in spite of the fact that we have demonstrated to the Arabs the enormous strengths of Israel, and I don't, don't just mean the military strengths, but the um, uh, strengths of the Israeli society, the resilience, the economic strengths, the um, uh, political strengths of Israel, what we are having is not, we, we are not going towards the, the conflict fading away, it is only mutating. It is taking a new form, and this form will probably persist for a very long period of time. Now, it's true that at the moment we are not facing a conventional military challenge, but in a way, even this is bad news, because when we had a battlefield where two armies were fighting, it was clear that we can win this battle. Now what the Arabs have done, they have obliterated the battlefield and they directly hit the Israeli population from their population so that we either do something about it and then we risk hitting Arab population or our population can be hit on a level that will disrupt life in Israel in a long time. So the fact that we no longer have a conventional threat is very good but there are many other ways of challenging Israel that are politically more complicated. And if you look at it beyond just the military aspect, I think needs uh, need to be uh, discussed in, in a different framework than what we are having here. 20 years ago, we assumed that the collapse of the Soviet Union and Oslo are indeed Sadat II, building on the shoulders of Sadat I. Namely, we've had the first positive change when Sadat came to Jerusalem. Now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Oslo process, we are taking the next step towards um, terminating the conflict. And what is now evident, or at least should be evident, is that the changes in the Middle East, including some positive elements of elements that seem to be positive since 2011, namely the Arab street becoming stronger and the um, leaders not, no longer being independent in their decisions, but they have to take into account what the population, what the society is thinking. Because of the radicalism of the Arab street, the situation is um, even worse. Because if you look at what Sadat changed, the most important change of Sadat was a paradigmatic change of breaking the taboo of the influence of the Arab street over the decisions of the Arab, uh, the Arab leader. And he broke the taboo and paid the price. And the important part was not that for the first time an Arab country could cooperate with Israel. This happened in 1948 between Israel and Jordan. But that on the normative level, on the open Seen, you can come and speak about reaching peace with Israel, even having a mutual strategic interests with Israel. And this gave some legitimacy of Israel in what the Arabs perceive as the Arab East. And this was supposed to, we expected it, to struggle with the most difficult problem that the Arabs have I think not only vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but also when they try to meet the challenges of the 21st century, namely a willingness to accept responsibility for the consequences of their own deeds, and their uh, attempt to stick to the pose of fighting Israel under any circumstances whatsoever, even when practically they were not doing it. This was the hope, but uh, unfortunately, what we've seen when it comes to the Arab street, that Sadat was willing to confront it and Arafat didn't even try. So the idea that the Oslo process will uh, start a new era were, of course, um, um, hopes that did not, did not materialize. When the Soviet Union collapsed, we expected things to change in a very major way. But we have come to a point where we must realize today that these hopes were completely without foundation. 
what was the hope that, among other things, produced Paris's idea of the new Middle East and the Oslo process? The idea was the following. In the new world, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you must open up your society. You must go beyond what the Arabs were willing to do in order to change, in order to adapt themselves to the modern world, or else you will not be able to deal with your position in the modern world. And then the Arabs understood that this is what they need to, to do, and they didn't do it. The expectation was when they do it, they, can, they must realize that perpetuating the conflict with Israel would be very dangerous for them, even detrimental to their attempts to deal with their own problems, and we haven't seen it. We have seen Sadat understanding it, confronting the Arab world. We have seen the leaders of the Arab world in the 1990s understanding that it needs to be done, but did not have the courage to confront it. And we have seen Arafat in the Oslo uh, process understanding that this is the illusion that the Israeli side has, and therefore all the Israelis are really asking very politely, please cheat us as if you are part of this change. And Arafat, being a very polite person, was willing to cheat, as he was um, practically asked, and did it for a while, but in the final analysis, it erupted in the way that uh, would not, um, should not have surprised anybody who understood the situation at the time. So what the Israelis understood is there is no Middle East and no new Middle East that is pluralistic and democratic and willing to accept us. There is no Palestinian national movement that is willing to partition the land and to accept a Jewish state. The Palestinian society is committed to terrorism and the role model of the Palestinians is the suicide bomber. And this changed in a very fundamental way the structure of not only the Israeli society, but also Israeli politics. And I would say, that we've had three periods. The first was between the 1930s and the 1980s, where you had a relatively small right, a relatively small left, and a very large uh, part of the Israeli political spectrum in the middle of the political spectrum, although part of the people who were practically center were masquerading as left. This is the Mapainiks, but even the Mapamniks and Ahdut Avodaniks and so on. The policy was a centrist policy, but some of them misrepresented themselves as being left, which is okay if it makes them happy. Then between 1980 and the year 2000, we had a polarization of the Israeli society, and the Israeli society was split right in the middle for 20 years, from the Lebanon War to the Second Intifada. You had on the one hand the left with the Arabs, on the other hand, the right with the ultra-Orthodox, and this paralyzed both sides, not in terms of steps that you can take for a short while, but in something that can survive the political reality of Israel. And since the year 2000, we came back to what we've had before these 20 years, namely, relatively a small right, relatively a small left, and a very large center, part of it masquerading as right. So it is somehow balancing what we had in the first period. And when we were split in the middle, the interesting thing is, the right said that security brings peace, which was a very simple-minded notion of security. Namely, security is territory, army, historical attachments, and so on. And the left said, peace brings security, and it had a very uh, simple-minded perception of peace, which basically means if we feel guilty, it's okay, let's have peace. And the change in the Israeli society became very deep, and I think that this is what is happening now, that the center has taken all the persuasive arguments of the right and the left, and you will see that the leftovers cannot persuade most of the Israelis. What have they taken from the right? The profound mistrust of the Arabs and in peace, 
and even elements of disrespect of the Arabs. You will find it very strongly in the Israeli center. And what they have taken from the left is the understanding that we need to partition the land, not in order to bring peace, but in order to disengage from the Arabs. So what the right and the left were left with are just leftovers. The right was left with a territorial appetite, the fantasy of a greater Israel, and the operative part of security. And the left was left with the fantasy of peace, and the feeling of guilt that makes them feel good. So what, what the center in Israel today can do is to say we have determination that the left doesn't have, and we have realism that the right doesn't have. And the combination of these two is called national resilience. Because if you combine determination and, and um, realism, basically you go back to becoming a mapinic, then the resilience of the Israeli society based on a very strong center is, is much stronger. So that both the right and the left are fighting a rear guard war. The majority of Israelis stopped listening to them. They both became irrelevant and the Israeli society is interested in focusing in building a society rather than in bringing peace, love, and brotherhood to the region, one way or another, with a greater Israel or with um, a pleasing, pleasing the Arabs. And the even more interesting element is that the deep left and the deep right have given up their attempt to persuade the people in the center of the political spectrum. And the right is building on radical Arabs and anti-Semites to do the, his job, their job for them. And the left is building on the hope that American or European pressure will make Israel uh, go where they uh, want to go. If we are coming to the very last um, uh, part of my presentation, the last elections, the last elections has have proven that the center has not only overtaken the society, but also is dictating the um, political system. And since the Israeli political system is very dysfunctional, I was very pleased and surprised to see how far it went in the last elections, how far the center managed to impose itself on the prime minister, on the Likud list, and create something that seems to me a far more centrist government than we've had in a very, in a very long time. And I think that if you look at the new realities in the Middle East, Israelis understand that in order to pursue what we used to call the peace process, A, there is no partner, neither a Syrian nor a Palestinian, and there are no regional um, circumstances that will make many things possible. For instance, you cannot determine what will happen in, in the West Bank not knowing what will become of Jordan. Certainly not to commit yourself to something that includes the Jordan Valley at the moment. But don't misunderstand me. And here, maybe Shai and I are not as far away as I would have enjoyed uh, uh, being with Shai. I agree that from an Israeli point of view, it is crucial to disengage from the West Bank, not because it will, not bring, pe not because it will bring peace. It won't. We will have, even if there is a Palestinian state, an irresponsible, unpleasant, and violent neighbor, but simply not to be there. Only since you can't do it in agreement, and the chances of agreement have been zero, are zero, and will be zero in the near future, to do it unilaterally, and this is a subject that we, uh, this is not the subject of today's discussion. Let me conclude by trying to characterize the attitude to peace and to becoming a um, part of the Middle East in the sense, again, not even of integration, but even the chance of being accepted here. 
Until the 1970s, the Israeli approach was one day. In the 80s and the 90s, the day is at hand. Since the year 2000, the attitude is not now, and since the Arab Spring, no way. So I think that this change is not something that will go away very soon. Every Israeli government will have to take into account that this is where the Israeli society stands today. And if we want to understand what will happen in the next few years, I would suggest that this would be one of our understandings that we will bring up every time we look at the bigger picture. Thank you. Well, fascinating. Thank you both um, for two very provocative and interesting presentations. Um, it's with a little bit of trepidation that I say that I disagree with you both. Um, uh, Shai, with Shai, I have a friendly debate about uh, you know, Israel's uh, um, uh, security situation at the moment. I mean, as the author of the, the end of Israel's 40-year peace, um, I, t I look at the Israel's current situation and see um, uh, dark clouds all around in many respects. And I, I, mean, you know, I think it would be an interesting if we went down each one of your, your six assets, and I think each one of these assets, I don't want to say each one, I think, I think there's a list of equally powerful, if not more powerful, um, negatives um, that, uh, that I think hover over Israel's security situation. And I think it's important if we take a moment to get into some of uh, that assessment. Um, and then, uh, Dan, um, uh, I, I, my, I humbly think you, you, you gild the lily a bit about uh, uh, how the Israelis at one point, um, uh, peace, love, and brotherhood, I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a bit of an exaggeration, actually. Um, I think uh, um, uh, the, uh, the center of Israel's body politic never really bought the idea of peace, love, and brotherhood. Um, and so I would, um, uh, I mean, if you look back and, you know, if you look at uh, what, was the, what was the Knesset vote on, uh, on Oslo II, you know, was, if I remember correctly, it was 61-59, which is, um, sort of reflects the deep division, even at the height of, uh, of the Oslo era, let alone, you know, after 2000. Um, so I think um, there's, there, there, there's a lot of very interesting meat in both of your presentations, um, a lot to delve into, especially as Israel looks at the next set of challenges ahead, uh, in which the region looks very different than it did for, uh, for most of the last 65 years. I mean, in a region in which um, you, th in theory, could have uh, uh, antagonistic regimes both in the near abroad and the far abroad. Um, which would be very different than, for example, the Ben-Gurion image of either uh, the periphery or the, or the core, but the possibility of Islamist regimes both on the border and uh, in the periphery um, uh, does raise a different sort of image, I think, for Israeli national security thinkers. So that's just all by way of, uh, of prompting a set of um, uh, discussion items. Let's, let me turn the floor over to you and your questions and your comments, and I'd be grateful if you would um, uh, direct your comments, or your question at least, to a specific speaker, and then we'll get our speakers back up here on the podium. Uh, again, please do speak from the podium. Uh, we'll get them back up here so we can have an engagement. Yes, we'll start over here, and then, then what did I say over here? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, in the, in the back um, and over here. So, go ahead. Thank you, Rob. My name is Saeed Eric, and I'm a Palestinian journalist. I have a very quick question for Don. You said that uh, there may be a unilateral actions that need to be taken, but that's another topic altogether. Could you give us a little taste of the, what that might be? And to Shai, what do you think, at what point, you're saying that uh, not, you know, there is no uh, intifada on the horizon, not allowed to be peace, and that is quite dangerous to Israel. At what point, in your opinion, will the whole peace process book will be closed? Thank you. Okay, uh, Don, you want to start? Okay. Well, this is a favorite subject of mine, and uh, if Rob would let me, it will take three hours just for the introduction. Let me try to see what I can do in two minutes. Yes, but not everybody else. Um, what I can do in two minutes. But then we uh, have to ask what happened to Dimitri. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I have always started from the assumption that the Palestinian national uh, movement cannot be a partner for uh, any kind of two state for two peoples, and I stress for two peoples solution. And therefore, I don't believe that it is possible today, A, because you can't make peace without Gaza, the Palestinians will not accept it. B, you can't make peace with Gaza, you can have some tricks there, but in the final analysis, the Israelis won't buy them. And third, because, as I mentioned, as you don't know what is happening with Jordan, you cannot come, you cannot come up at the moment with final border delineation, and the Palestinians will not accept the state with temporary borders. So what I uh, am suggesting for a long time is an Israeli-American agreement, not between Israel and the Palestinians, but between Israel and America, where Israel is transferring territory from area C to area B and from area B to area A in a pace and the selection of uh, territorial elements as the Israelis see fit in order to create as much as possible contiguity in the West Bank provided Israel can finish with American support defense against uh, uh, terrorism around the West Bank and that the Americans shelter Israel from um, European and UN pressure. Uh, this should also make it possible for Israel to consolidate its hold over about 6% of the territory in the uh, settlement blocks. I don't want to go into more detail again because this is not the place to discuss it and because the essence of my argument is that the Palestinian issue is by far not the most important element and therefore the Israeli society should go in a different direction. So I don't want to undermine my own argument into, by going too much into this, but um, I believe that th the options are unilateral Israeli action or staying there for a very long time in a way that undermines the basic interests of Israel. Thank you. Shai? Um, uh, to be precise, what I said was uh, not that there won't be uh, a third intifada, but that in a way I'm more worried about the possibility that there won't be a third intifada and that because of that, uh, the hard decisions that Israel, in my view, has to take uh, to make uh, will, will be postponed further. Now, if you ask me, you know, at what point, I think that, I think that um, at best, in our profession, at best, we can point to trends. To predict a timeline, what would happen, you know, what exactly would be, uh, you know, the breaking point, what would uh, ignite or not ignite a third intifada? I mean, uh, maybe uh, there were 10 people at the Washington Institute that predicted the Arab awakening. But outside the Washington Institute, I don't know anybody who predicted uh, the Arab awakening. Not what happened in Egypt, not what happened in Syria, but not what happened in Syria, you know, throughout, you know, from the beginning till today. The fact that, you know, we would see whatever we saw. And I don't know how many experts are in this room on Turkey, but I still haven't heard anybody that says, hey, 10 days ago I saw what we're seeing today happening in, 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 in Istanbul and now in other cities in, in, in Turkey. So, you know, we can at best point to the problematics of the situation, but you know, your, the answer to your question, I just don't have an answer to your question as to what, you know, at what point can this happen? And at what point will everybody have given up uh, irreversibly? And uh, I would say that my observation is that we're not at that point yet. But again, I'm talking about something different, slightly different from what Dan is talking about, okay? I, I actually think that, I, as I said earlier, I actually take Netanyahu's word seriously uh, because I don't think it can count as propaganda when he says, you know, this other alternative is for me a nightmare. Uh, so that gives some room. And, and you know, we, 
I think that um, we have different philosophies, but also I've always seen, I've always been schizophrenic about my role because my role has always been not just to be an analyst where you could be, you know, constantly the prophet of gloom and doom, but also to see what opportunities are there. And I treat the Middle East as a very, very, very bad economy. Okay, and a good entrepreneur finds opportunities and cracks in a bad economy. So I'm looking for the cracks. And I, again, I'm not in dispute with uh, you know, what Rob said, but I just said, you know, if I were to repeat here his testimony to Congress, then he'd never invite me again because it would be boring. So no, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Hillel in the back. Uh, Hello, Fratman of the Hudson Institute. Uh, I, my question is primarily directed to, to Dan, but I'd be happy if Shai commented on it as well. I, uh, Dan, you make a very uh, powerful case for the transformation of Israeli society, and the most direct implication of that is the um, uh, loss of any real expectations regarding a settlement with Palestinians. What you didn't say is what you thought that means with regard to the other external challenges, uh, at least some of those that were listed by Shai, but any others that you might think are relevant. What is this new, new spirit in, this new old spirit uh, in Israel mean for the direction of uh, Israel, or the way in which Israel might see the external environment? In what? Uh, in the, exter the external environment. You fo I'll, I'll try to translate from your fine English. Um, uh, uh, you focused on the, this, this change in Israel and how it affects the relationship with the Palestinians. What about all the other issues on Israel's external environment? Okay, hold on a second. Let, let's get a few more questions in. Uh, Bob Friedman. Right behind you. There you go. Uh, Robert Friedman, Johns Hopkins University. I wonder if both of the commentators could comment on Yair Lapid. He seems to be swinging back and forth, and he would seem to me if Israel is indeed interested either in a unilateral move or maybe something more than that, he is key. But one day appears to say one thing and another day another thing. So I wonder how you see his future and his role in the coalition vis-a-vis -vis the possible peace process if one exists with the Palestinians. Great. Hand your microphone right next door. Hi, Jonathan Reinhold, uh, Barilan, and George Washington. It's for both of you, and it's um, similar to the last two questions. I want to refine it. Um, we can say that Israel has four issues to deal with strategically. Iran, um, the issue of um, the Palestinians' partition, the wider instability in the region, and the fourth one, the strategic effects of dealing with the ultra-Orthodox economic and serving in the army. So it's very nice to do a list, but... Um, in the real world of politics, you have to prioritize. And right now, Israel's prioritizing on the domestic issues. So I'd like you to perhaps look forward over a, a horizon of two to three years and sketch out what you think is a, political, a politically realistic uh, agenda which looks at those trade-offs and, and suggests where Israel should go. Okay, let's take these and then we'll go to uh, Maury, Laura, and David. Gentlemen, who wants to go? Uh, I, I didn't understand what the. Okay. Um, you're right. There is an interconnection between uh, between these uh, these questions. Um, I would say this, and and this is where um, I guess where we are right now. Uh, my assessment of where we are right now, especially having to do with. Uh, what you refer to as the Palestinian issue, I'm not sure is that different from Dan. Uh, how we got there, who has and had agency uh, in getting us to this point, that's a huge debate, and uh, um, we will have to go back to the Russian kolkhoz to, to, uh, to, to, to conduct that debate in terms of how long. Uh, how long uh, it would uh, it would take, but let me just say that for me, uh, the issue the issue that worries me is not the what people refer to as the Palestinian issue. 
And for the purpose of this discussion, which is about Israel's security in this new environment, I did not mention the word peace. Not that I don't want peace, but I stuck to my marching orders, talking about Israel's challenges in this environment. So for me, this is not about, this is about Israel. This is about Israel, Israel's future, and when I say Israel's future, it's not just you know, a framework called the state, but the state that, as I understood the Founding Fathers having wanted to, to see it. So, you know, that's the thrust of, you know, where I am on this, on this issue, just to make it, make it clear. However, however, there is, a, there is an issue, and that, of course, is exacerbated to some extent by the developments of the last two and a half years. Look, there is a narrative uh, out there uh, especially by some of the countries that remain more uh, on the on the pro-American side, that say and they say this quietly, endlessly to Israelis, okay, we have a lot of common interests in the region. In fact, we would like to cooperate with you, and we would like, and we are co of course, <laughs> quietly they would say, we are cooperating quietly. But we would like to do more, and we would like to be less quiet about it. But we have a public opinion issue. Now, of course, some of them, you know, there is an easy, there is a tendency to just, kind of, you know, just sweep this around and say, this is not serious, this is just an excuse, and so on and so forth. But the Arab awakening has made what looked to many as simply an excuse to be, it was, it's, it's more difficult to dismiss this argument that public opinion doesn't matter. And to the extent to which the argument is, this continuous festering of this conflict with the Palestinians, and this is not new, I mean, this message has you know, pre preceded the Arab awakening by at least a decade. This continuous festering and the, and the, ra the radiation of this in Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, whatever you want, is complicating our situation in terms of our ability to, to, to coordinate, to be something that looks more like an alliance. So in my view, these, in fact, these are connected. It's not you know, that they are one in connected one-to-one, -one, but, uh, but, but, but they are connected. Um, I would say this. Um, in my view, uh, if, and I say if, if the Prime Minister wants to give diplomacy a chance, the combination, it's not just Lapid, okay? It's Lapid, it's the at least formal position that Naftali Bennett has taken. Naftali Bennett's position is, this is not serious? Okay, fantastic. If it's not serious, and that's, he continues to say, because of that, there is nothing, I don't see any reason to leave the government over this issue, which, by the way, is not different from the position that Avigdor Lieberman took at the time, which said, this is not serious, okay? Once it's serious, once a real proposal will be on the table, we'll make our decision. Fine, okay, as long as that's the case, then the government actually has rope. Now, we have another change that is not something that you can see in the short range, short, short term, but it's significant. The fact that there, is, there has been a coup d'etat at the, at the, at the uh, pinnacle of Shas is potentially significant because Arya Deri's position on these issues is very different from Eli Ishai's. Now, there is a limit to, how, how, to what extent and how quickly Deri will be able to change Shas's direction. But potentially, again, because my role is not to give all the negatives, I have the chairman here on my right, but to see where the cracks are, there's another crack here. So the bottom line in my view is that it's very difficult for Netanyahu to build a convincing, compelling case today that he's completely you know, bounded. He actually has room. And whether you know, diplomacy would now be clever enough to try now again, and I know that Dan will now accuse me of, you know, this is now fantasy land and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about that, okay? I'm talking about the initiation of a process, the ending of the total 
deadlock that we've been at, I say Netanyahu has room for maneuver here. And, uh, uh, and, I, and by the way, the center, I think that the last Israeli elections has been a reaffirmation of the center. But we have to remember that the phenomenon of an Israeli center, that's not new. The, the elect, Israeli uh, electoral history has changed in 1977, okay? That's when, remember that when labor lost its hege hegemony in the 77 elections, it didn't, that 15, 17% didn't go to Likud. They went to Dash, okay? And, and since those elections, there, you know, there's been Shinoi, there's been the center party, there's been, you know, and so it's the same 15, 17% that has looked for a leader. Now, the big challenge for Lapid, and Netanyahu put a little trap there, right? Putting him in charge of the finance ministry. But he may, he may, he may, be, he, he may surprise people. And his biggest challenge is to make sure that this is not like the, pre the previous experiences, a one to maximum two electoral cycles party. And as I said already, I confess that I'm very bad in predictions. I don't know. Dan is excellent in predictions, so he'll be able to give you the answer. <laughs> Dan? Um, first of all, concerning the external environment, I suppose you mean primarily um, Europe, the United States. I think that the trend is uh, Israel being distanced against its will from Europe. In Europe, we have an interesting phenomenon. The governments in Europe, with the exception of three or four, are relatively either pro-Israeli or fair-minded. But public opinion, particularly educated public opinion, is drifting away from Israel in a very major way. And governments in Europe uh, have no choice but to follow it. So even if they understand very well some of the strategic considerations that should bring them to pursue policies much closer to the American uh, policy, if they want to maintain their legitimacy in Europe itself. And since they don't count anyhow, so whatever they do doesn't have a major impact on the region anyhow, they are going in a direction that from an Israeli um, a point of view is a negative one. So I would assume that the, I would predict, I would expect that uh, uh, Israel will be f more and more further away from Europe, again, not because it's Israel's will, but because this is what public opinion, the mainstream of public opinion in Europe will dictate. And at the same time, I believe that the relations with the United States are deepening in a way that my most optimistic dreams would never have expected. So uh, what we are getting is a shift in, the, in this direction. Now, of course, when it comes to international organizations, they become more hostile by the week. I'm just expecting the UN to condemn Israel for killing the Dead Sea. We just need to wait a little bit, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure it's coming. So there, there is no hope whatsoever, and no kind of diplomacy can, can uh, change it. Uh, concerning Yair Lapid, First of all, I'm not sure that he knows exactly where he's standing on some of these issues. But if you look at his basic approach, and you could have followed it over many years because he was writing in Idiot Achronot about the Israeli society, about many of the things that concern us in our regional environment and so on. So we have an idea where his basic sentiment lies, even if uh, even if we don't know specifically his position on this or that. I think that he, A, is a centrist, and B, understands that his electorate is in the center. So whatever I described about the mainstream of Israeli public opinion, the direction that it's taking, namely, on the one side, a profound misbelief in Arabs and in peace, and on the other hand, an understanding that the partitioning of the land is necessary for the pursuit of Zionism. Not because the Palestinians deserve it, not because it will bring peace, but because we shouldn't cohabitate with the Palestinians. Not because 
there is any moral reason to do so, but simply because it's bad for us to cohabitate with the Palestinians. I think that he is going in this direction. And the other thing is, wherever you can, without pay paying a prohibitive price, pretend to be nice or really be nice, let's be nice. I think this is more or less uh, what uh, he would... No, not <laughs> for me. In your policy. No, 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 not my policy. I mean, I'm trying to pretend here because you asked me to be polite. I'm trying to pretend here that I'm nice, but I've never been accused of, of that ever and never been insulted by being called nice before. But I think that Yair Lapid is nice. I mean, others have this privilege. I mean, if I'm not there, somebody else has to carry the torch. Uh, concerning the um, a question of uh, Iran, um, Palestinians, ultra-Orthodox, first of all, I'm delighted we, you, you mentioned them all in one group, because this is more or less where I stand about the ultra-Orthodox, although uh, other enemies may not be as dangerous to the State of Israel and to the Jewish people. But I don't think that we need to have here one or the other. I think that vis-a-vis, -vis, the question of the ultra-Orthodox and the question of Iran are separate. You don't have in Israel groups that would be for this or against this that can be in any way uh, bring us to the point where you say, if you want to be very strict about bringing the uh, ultra-Orthodox to work for the first time in their life, this does not mean that you have to attack or not to attack Iran. This is not the, uh, it, it, it doesn't stand one against the other. I believe that the outrage against the ultra-Orthodox is very genuine. I'm sorry that it came 50 years too late. I would have loved it, uh, loved to see it. Uh, uh, half a century ago, but now may be the last moment to do something about it because it has a huge impact on the Israeli society, particularly with the number of children that they have and so on. And I don't think it's any way uh, related, um, uh, any way related to the other issues that uh, you've mentioned. Uh, let me make two very short comments, one on something that Rob said and the other about something that Chai said. First, I accept the criticism of Rob concerning the um, peace, love, and brotherhood. I should not have said that this, is the, uh, this was the commitment of a very large part of the Israeli society, but a very large part of the Israeli elite. The Israeli elite was mesmerized uh, by it in... Um, in the 80s and, um, uh, and the 90s, and uh, whereas it is not true about the whole Israeli society. Concerning something that uh, Shai said about um, relating to uh, Arab public opinion and trying to um, make it possible for people in the Arab world to cooperate with us by giving them something they can present to Arab public opinion. Arab public opinion, or the Arab street, as they call it, is more radical than the, um, than the leaders. And therefore, I don't think that we can um, do something by appealing to them. Should we try? Yes. Am I, am I against it? No. I mean, diplomacy is something you give to diplomats and you say, do whatever you can, as long as nothing serious is involved in it. But uh, when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to trying to help them do something by looking good, I don't think that there is anything that Israel can do that will make it look good for more than two weeks because immediately somebody will say that it's not enough. And uh, particularly because the Palestinians will all, always push it. To give you only one example, after um, Camp David in the year 2000, Abu Mazen said, well, they've given us 94%. If they've given us 94%, why not 100%? Okay, and this is the, the kind of response that we will get. Should we try and do something that will be nice? Yes. Do I expect very much from it? No. Okay, thank you. So I got Laura, Maury, and David for this round, please. Uh, microphone up here on my right. Hi, Laura Cutler from American University. I just wanted to add a fifth factor to what Jonathan Reinhold said, and it's something that hasn't been mentioned today. I'm wondering if it's because the focus of this conversation is the external situation and what I'm going to ask relates or not. 
and that has to do with Israel's Arab population. Someone could address whether they're even a factor in this conversation. Okay, thank you. You mentioned the ultra-Orthodox. You didn't mention the Arab population. Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with the uh, Kerry uh, Peace Initiative uh, right now. It seems as though he's willing to raise or give $4 billion to the Palestinian side, and it seems that to counterbalance this, he would have to give some kind of uh, security guarantees to the Israelis. Uh, do you think that Israel will maintain its position not to depend on the United States for its security uh, by way of treaty or by perhaps putting uh, some troops down along the uh, Jordan River Valley. Thank you, Maury. David? Um, Dan, when you say Israel should not cohabit with the Palestinians, can you just elaborate a little bit? When, do you accept the... Uh, no, do you, do, you allow, do you accept Shai's point that, that Israel, if it does nothing, it slides towards de facto binationalism? How urgent is that for you in terms of, not because of peace and not because of the Palestinians and not because of anyone, how urgent is it for you in terms of the character of Israel? And for you, Shai, you know, the theme about Israel and the whirlwind and how it connects, we've heard really diametrically uh, opposed approaches. Uh, I think Netanyahu in the Knesset uh, back in November, I believe, I find you the quote, where he says, given what's going on in the region, Basically, Israel has to hunker down. He doesn't use the word hunker down. Then we had President Obama come in March, and same city of Jerusalem said, given what's going on in the region, Israel has to speed things up, because with the advent of Arab democratic politics, this impasse essentially will lead to greater radicalization. Um, and I you know, imply the ascendance of political Islam, unless this, this thing is settled now. So I know your personal view on this because you just you made it clear about binationalism, but I would just like you to comment on this diametrically opposed speeches of the importance of dealing with this issue in the whirlwind of, of these regional developments, and what are the variables that would impact the Israeli political elite between these two very different approaches? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, over here on the, on the left, take a question. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, so if you could. Uh, this is Shebnam Gümüşçü from Sabancı University, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh -huh. um, I have a question about uh, the way you formulate, both of the speakers formulate the Arab street becoming more stronger, much stronger uh, since 2011. Uh, it seems to me that there may be another way to look at uh, the fact that Arab string is spring, uh, street is becoming stronger. Uh, the fact that the authoritarianism and anti-Israeli position of the Arab people are indeed two sides of the same coin. Because uh, the foreign policy, when you look at the Mubarak era, is the only thing that people could discuss more or less freely uh, when it comes to politics. But now that there is a transition going on, people start to talk about their domestic concerns and they, they start to question democracy, rights, freedoms, and it seems that foreign policy becomes less of a concern and it's not so much of a prior priority for the people in the street because they have other concerns and other issues to talk about. So, uh, and this is not limited to the Arab world. Turkey has just started facing the face of this new wave. And in fact, Europe and United States has also faced uh, this wave and a, a call for democratic housekeeping is uh, getting stronger throughout the world. My question is, would you agree with this assessment that democracy becomes a greater concern and this may in fact affect Israel in terms of its dealing with the uh, other countries in the region? And do you think that uh, Israel should also start thinking about uh, a, a possibility that this, may, this wave may also affect it, its uh, domestic politics and there may be a occupy something movement in Israel as well? And uh, look, let me, since this is going to be our final round, I just want to throw in one more item. And it's as much a comment as a, uh, a question. The one area where both of you agreed um, was on the importance of the strength of the U.S.-Israel relationship as an asset. 
and um, uh, not trying to be too much of a gadfly, um, I'm going to question this for both of you and in the following sense. Um, I think over the last period of time, we've gotten used to a very odd dichotomy, which is the growth of a strong and deep US-Israel bilateral relationship at the same time as what appears to be a growing American detachment from the broader Middle East. Is this phenomenon in, is in Israel's interest? Is Israel's interest somewhere in the future to see itself as an island of alliance with the United States in a sea of American disinterest in the Middle East? I would argue the answer is no, but um, I wanted to put that out to you because I think that's, I think that's a very important issue underlining both of your presentations. Gentlemen. Shy, or yours. He's like Colombo. Remember how Colombo, just as he was approaching the door, turns around and asks <laughs> the most difficult, uh, the most difficult question. That's why they pay me the big bucks around. Yeah, right. Um, maybe I should talk to my board. Uh, so. Um, I don't, you know, I, I guess, uh, again, with this last question, you've opened up, I mean, you've, you're sort of inviting us in 30 seconds or so to inject ourselves into a huge debate because the real, I mean, I am not entirely convinced that uh, what we are in fact seeing necessarily is an American uh, detachment from the Middle East. Uh, you know, I. Believe me, I read everything there is to read about the pivoting to Asia uh, and so on and so forth. I, I'm just not convinced that uh, people are not uh, over-interpreting the president's reluctance to get involved in the Syrian quagmire as, you know, a decision to or taking America out of the Middle East. But here again is my own personal biases, I think that uh, I, I myself have been, I would say this, uh, for, first of all, I have a lot of sympathy uh, for a nation that has shed blood and so much uh, a assets uh, and capital, uh, human capital and financial capital, in two horrible wars over the last 12, 13 years, that um, the president would be as careful, skeptical uh, as he is in a situation where it's not exactly a situation similar to uh, when George Bush mounted that little, you know, mountain of rubble uh, after 9-11 uh, and, uh, you know, said what he said because it was clear at after, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. And I think that he is facing a situation in Syria where it's very hard. You have to talk in terms of percentages, you know, between being good and being bad uh, in these different camps. So I'm not, so first of all, so I would say this. I agree with you. If we had a situation where America was really detaching itself from the region, that would be bad for Israel because, because it's not only important to have an, an alliance, it's important that the ally would be engaged. And to the extent, if you were right about your premise, then it would be very worrisome. But I would say, say you know, I remember that I, when I was here in 1987 or 88, and it was the 10th anniversary of the Jaffe Center. And uh, I brought, and remember that uh, there was a little party here, but anyway, uh, General Yariv came over. And um, I, I think it's okay that I say on, on the record that I called a very senior um, official in the state, in the, in the Department of Defense in the Pentagon, and I said, you know, General Yariv is coming and so on and so forth. And he was sort of at the assistant secretary, I think, level at the time. 
And uh, General Yariv was, uh, before he became famous as director of military intelligence and part of the miracle of the 67 triumph, he was military attaché in Washington in, 19, in the late 50s. And, and this is, I'm talking now about 86, not 2013, where the relationship are even deeper and more intimate than they were in 1986. But when I walked General Yariv into the Pentagon in 1986, and we walked into a, a, a particular, you know, slightly, you know, isolated, uh, separated part of the Pentagon where this Assistant Secretary of Defense wa office was. General Yariv turned to me in the corridor and said, you know, when I was defense attaché in Washington, our foot, we could not set foot in this part of the corridor. This is 1986. So, and in my view, we've seen a revolution since 1986. Forget about, you know, what was in the 50s. So, yes, I mean, there is this problem, if the premise is correct. But I'm just saying, you know, Israel's relations and the relations between Israel and the defense community here, and the relations between the general staff and the Joint Chiefs today, Ben-Gurion would have only defined it as unbelievable. So we, you know, again, I look at the, I try to look at the positive, uh, at the positive sides. Um, I don't even know how to, okay. So let me just, again, uh, let me just uh, give you some headlines in terms of my answers to these other questions. And I'm taking, as you see, things from the end to the beginning, because in my advanced age, I don't even remember what the beginning was. So um, on this issue of the Arabs, the street, and, and, and so on and so forth, I, I think, you know, your points are, your points are well taken. Let me just say the following, which also has to do with the heart of, you know, the potential maybe disagreement or l different emphasis that was in my presentation where I tried to look at the positives and, and again, Rob's testimony, which was fascinating uh, to the U.S. Congress. And let me just say the following, which is, in my view, the real critical, I mean, again, I differentiate between the tactical, operational, and the strategic, grand strategic. There is no question that at the tactical operational level, we have a problem now. Forget about five years from now, 10 years from now. But at the grand strategic question, if you take, for example, Egypt, which is not for example, we say for example, Egypt. Egypt is the most important, largest, most populous, serious neighbor uh, that we have, and the only country that is not an artificial derivative of Sykes-Picot. So, so, so what, is the real what is the real question here? The real question is, if you take, project, let's say Morsi, and we can't know whether Morsi will be around five years from now or not, but let's assume that there will be a Morsi there five years from now, a Morsi there. In my view, the real question is the following, which is, would he first and foremost behave as a Muslim brother, or would he first and foremost behave as the president of Egypt? Now, I would submit to you that on foreign policy issues to date, Morsi has behaved rightly, wrongly, didn't make, yes, made mistakes, not made mistakes, first and foremost behaved as the president of Egypt. The way he conducted himself during the Gaza affair, he conducted himself not as a Muslim brother, but as the president of Egypt. And all you need to, to, to read to be able to ascertain this fact is the disappointment in Hamas. You know, Hamas thought there would be a revolution in Egyptian-Gaza relations, and there was, there was a slight change, but I would say no revolution. Where he has behaved as a Muslim brother and not as president of Egypt is internally, which goes back to this question of what matters. But that's not in the immediate range a concern uh, uh, for, for Israel. So that's the way I would look at it. Um, I think uh, to your question, David, I mean, you've said or hinted, I would say it differently, which is, I actually don't think that Bibi has made up his mind, which is to say that I think there are two things here. On one hand, I think, again, I take it seriously, I think that he is deeply worried about the effects of these trends that we see. But I think that at the same time, Bibi is not a, you know, a grand strategic decider. Uh, he can, he be, can, can think in grand strategic terms, but when it comes to deciding, he is risk averse. So, so, the, so, so there is a kind of a disconnect between his analysis, and you see it on Iran, by the way, but I want to get into that at five minutes to two, but you also see it here, 
which is his analysis makes him very worried about the implications of the trends. But he's risk averse, personally he's risk averse, so he hunkers down and says, well, in this situation where everything is changing, how can we make any major decision because we don't know what the consequences of these uh, decisions will be? And Rob will remind me already in a minute that my time is up. So let me just end by uh, saying only one thing. And that's actually sort of a comment also to lots of things that were said here and also to, to Dan. It may be, it may be, I would say, that peace in the Shimon Peres version of it, uh, or the Dan Shiftan interpretation of the Shimon Peres version, was a phenomenal illusion or fantasy. But let me just add by adding another exclamation point, which is, there is no un totally pure unilateral solution to this issue. This is, an, this is equally a fantasy, because if you just take the security dimension of to, to make sure that we're not faced with at least the potential of another Lebanon, another Gaza, in a situation where it, it, the West Bank is infinitely more complicated because its proximity to where the core of Israel is, and because it's not Lebanon or Gaza, it's an area where we have interspersed settlers in the territory in a way that makes it very, very complicated. So the idea that we can one day do what we did in Gaza or Lebanon is a complete fantasy. There is no such thing. And the absurd element of this means that if you're serious about recognizing that this is an existential issue and Israel has to disengage, it has to disengage in some kind of a partnership with the PA. So, so peace may be an illusion, but without a partnership that allows coordination on this issue, there is no unilateral option that anybody can subscribe to. So that's an equally large illusion. Thank you. Dan, you get, uh, thank you very much, Shai. You get um, uh, your time to answer as well, please. First of all, I'm very fortunate today that the questions are all about books that I've written. Uh, first about the disengagement and now about uh, uh, Arabs in Israel. Um, first of all, the impact on the Arabs in Israel about what we've discussed here, the strategic situation in Israel, is negligible. But one very interesting point, if you want to look at it from a domestic perspective, the Arabs in Israel have benefited from the distortions that Israeli society was willing to make vis-a-vis -vis the ultra-Orthodox, and now they will bear the consequences of the other extreme. Because you have here 